week's portion uh, to just talk to you for a couple of minutes and uh, not to get into um, the long, drawn out discourse, uh, but to talk to you about gossip. Some people say and think that gossip means that you're talking about someone, and when you're talking about someone, what you're saying is wrong. That's not true. Most gossip is truth. Most gossip is the truth that people are telling. However, they really have no business taking other people's business and spreading it around the world. They have no business making it like peanut butter and jelly. Do we, uh, any of us like peanut butter and jelly? You gotta spread it very even. And sometimes people take gossip and they think that they are that their whole being is to say something, and then they'll say, well, what, why are you telling that person's business? They'll say, well, it's the truth. It doesn't matter that it's the truth. It's still gossip. See, gossip isn't a lie. Gossip can be a lie, but you can also gossip when you're talking the truth. You know, well, I was telling the truth. Well, you were gossip, and that's not good. And in antiquity, we're told and you know, is it true? I don't think so, because if it were true that everybody that spread the evil tongue would suffer from leprosy, I think every Israelite would have been leprous. That's me. If it were true today that our gossip and our tongues were responsible for leprosy, Y'all would call me Snow White. Actually, in, a, uh, in two weeks when I called Havdalah. The word Havdalah means to separate or it means to set apart. It is difficult as human beings to really set ourselves apart. What does that mean to be set apart? Does it only mean that you set yourself apart in how you dress? Well, that is one method of setting yourself apart that you are dressed a little differently, and being so dressed differently, you can set yourself apart and dress and people say, oh, I can see that. So you are setting yourself apart when you wear a kippah every day, some type of head covering that people will see and recognize that it's not a dude cap, it's not a do rag but it is some type of emblem of something that they may not understand what it is, but they understand that you're different. So that you are set apart. Young women are set apart in their dress, in their demeanor as well. So that we would suspect that women of Israel would dress in a way that does not matter what the occasion might be, that their dress is that which we could call and label appropriate dress, appropriate dress. So some people say, well, Rabbi, that means that uh, it should be culture. Culture is fantastic. I think it is nice. I think it is important. I think it does serve as a means of setting one apart to an extent. But then there have to be other layers. And that next layer of setting apart has to be within the construct of our action. Because you can have on all of the culture that you want. And if you're still sticking up people, you're just a dude in culture sticking up folks. You're just, you can have all the culture that you want. But if that culture does not resonate into your actions and making you dictate how you act, then what does being in culture mean? What does being in a key part that mean? Absolutely nothing. If you're doing everything that everybody else does, when they do it, you can have on six key paws, five dashikis, four boobas, five pair of pants, six pair of sandals, toenails painted, and it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Because the Actions don't dictate and speak to the culture that we say that we're manifesting and putting forth. 
I think that in my humble opinion, leprosy came on individuals just as any of us today might be struck with a abnormality. And it's not necessarily because of something that someone did, that something happened to them. Because if that were the case, then I don't think any of us would, would be here. But unfortunately, people are like that. People will, are like, well, if that happened to you, then you must have this. And such and such must have that. Because that can happen to me because that, because I am such and such and so and so. And that's absolutely unequivocally untrue. Because most of us are good today and something else tomorrow and something else the day after that and something else two days later. Oh, and then we come back to being that something good that we was talking about. But we step out of that being something good whenever don't take me there. You know how we get from So trying to be consistent is something that we're all working at. Let me put it this way. Trying to be good consistently is something that we should all be working at because you can be bad consistently and consistently bad. But the objective is in my understanding, that we take these laws and we try to apply them to our lives and to teach our children and our grandchildren. And that means every child in this community is, a, is my child. They are our children. And we must be seeking ways to provide that moral support for them that they not only hear from us, but that they see us demonstrating and living. So this idea of gossip, what is gossip? If you're not saying it to the person that it's about, then it's gossip. You know what? It's gossip. Because you're not taking it to the purpose. And if you're taking it to the person, after you do it, you don't have to go and tell so and so what you told such and such. It's gossip. Will it cause a break to fall on you? I don't know. I hope not. Will it cause your hair to turn yellow? I don't know. I hope not. Some people die in their hair yellow anyway. But that's okay. Torah calls yellow hair like a, a leprous condition. That's okay too. I'm not saying you can't. If you just want to be blonde, it's okay. With me, I'm not a judge of blonde. So. But I am a judge to say that how we understand and look at this idea of gossip. So the example of that is in the book of Numbers, in the 12th chapter. We're all familiar with a woman that is declared to be a prophetess. She's declared to be a prophetess, Miriam. Yet Miriam, the prophetess, the holy woman who led the women of Israel in song at the Sea of Reeds, was struck with death. She was struck with leprosy. This is where it gets from the gospel. Because she told the truth. Moses married an Ethiopian woman. That was true. That was a true statement. That wasn't a lie. But how did she say it? To whom did she say it? And what manner was it put forth? in such a way that it was consented by God to be gospel. And he called Miriam and Aaron and said, come forth, you two, to the tent of me. Why were you not afraid to speak against my servant? 
Miriam could have said, it's the truth, God. Then she would have been right. But if because you don't like what someone does, you cannot now take that and I don't like it. Well, that's you. Unfortunately, in our lives, and particularly in this way of life, too many folks want to draw up their own torus. And they want to try to, you know, put people in NATO in their understanding of the Torah. Well, this is how we used to do it. Well, this is how I do it. And that's fine. But your way may not be the Torah way. That may be your Torah and not the Torah. Because there is a distinct understanding and differentiation in how the laws are understood. I don't argue with anybody when they say any type of tassel is a zeep zeep. I don't make that argument. I understand in my tradition what a zeep zeep is, what it constitutes, what it means. Every element of it. That the knots have a meaning. That the wraps between the knots have a meaning. So that we're just not talking about this being representative of our heart. We're saying through this Knocks and these breaths, what do we say? That God is one. That's what it spells. That's what the, the numerology comes to. That God is one. So that's why there's seven, eight, eleven, and thirteen breaths. That's why there are five knots. That's why there are eight strings. It has a significance. But you might come from a community where it says, Take it off the shade if it gets that look like it, and that's fine. With that person, with that individual, I won't argue with it because that's what they understand and they've been what they were in the talk. This all uh, this idea of leprosy, just isn't affiliated with necessarily what we say, but also how we say it. So let us be careful. Never made that mistake of saying the right thing but the wrong way. Yeah. What you said is absolutely right, but the how you said it is absolutely wrong. So you can be right in what you say is wrong in how you say it. So let us look into each of ourselves more deeply. And let us learn, in my humble opinion, in my estimation, to learn to put the brain here. How many of you guys got driver's license? So if you're going to drive, I hope you step on the brake before you put the car in here, right? And you look down at it, right? You're not like that guy in that commercial where you let the woman go by with the stroller. He waving, he's so busy waving. He thinks he got his car in reverse, he got his car in drive, and he tears to the garage. Tears his garage totally up. Or the guy who's up in the tree cutting the branch, and his name was, he don't put no rope on the branch he's cutting, and his name is Carl. He thinks that the branch is in his yard. No, the branch overextends into his neighbor's yard. So he cuts the branch and tows the man's car. It happens. It happens. We have to do our best, I think, at all times, to investigate, to look before we leap, to think before we act, to absolutely unequivocally think before we speak. Because the book tells us very plainly that a brother or a sister offended is harder to win than a fixed city. So it says that you could go out and knock down the walls of Jerusalem before you can get the affection back of a man or a woman that you have offended with your tongue. Because it is deep. It's deeper than a slap. It's like the old adage I told you many years ago, that old rabbinic saying, when a person puts gossip out on someone, and he says, oh, forgive me, I'm very sorry. He says, yes, I will forgive you if you do one thing for me. He said, what do I have to do? He 
to take his pillow of feathers to the mountain in our city. Wait for the windiest day and cut it open and shake all of the feathers out. Once all of the feathers have left, you go and collect them all, put them back in the pillow. When you complete that task, you will be forgiven. <laughs> That's hard to do because the wind has taken those feathers up everywhere. And that's what happens with our words. That's why they should be guarded. That's why we say, guard my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking deceitfully. To those who curse me, let my soul be silent. Let my soul be like dust to everyone. Open my heart to your Torah. Then my soul shall pursue your commandments. As for those who desire evil against me, speedily nullify their counsel and disrupt their desires. So don't you worry about getting evil. Right. Let the eternal work that work for you. And the eternal bless us. The eternal keep us. The eternal sustain us. As we enter into this holy season, today there should have been a little form for you to fill out in the bulletin. That form is for the Seder. The community Seder is going to be Monday, April the 14th. The Seder will start at 7 o'clock in the p.m. I emailed out to everyone instructions for cleaning your home for Passover. If you did if you did not have email or you did not receive it, I did ask that they make some extra copies and put them on the table. Uh, your home should be uh, free of leaven by next Monday, the 14th by like 11 o'clock in the morning. The stoves, everything should be clean. All of the instructions are there. If you have questions about cleaning, about what to eat or what you can't eat, please do not hesitate to give me a call. Uh, I always recommend that during the days of unleavened bread, that you do not, that you refrain from eating in restaurants. Uh, because you do not know what they're cooking with. Macaroni is leaven. Can't eat it. The flour is on. The chicken is leaven. You can't eat it. The very nature of how they cook in the restaurant that they're cooking in, the place is filled with leaven. Leavening is that thing that we're not even supposed to get out of our bodies. It is symbolic of spiritual cleansing, of a spiritual view. So we take these seven days of unleavened bread. So Rabbi, that kind of say eight. I know. The Torah says seven. Our community has always observed seven days of unleavened bread. On Tuesday, the 50th will be the first day service of unleavened bread. And on Monday, April the 21st, be the seventh day service. Both of those services uh, start at 10.30 in the morning. The next Shabbat is Shabbat Haggadot, the great Shabbat that immediately preceded the Exodus. So, there are no questions, announcements, evening services this afternoon. We do hope that you can stay. Thank God for you.